Thank you so very much. In my, my heart, it really... I'm blessed to be a part of a church that not only uh, is a church that assembles here on Sunday, but really have an opportunity to influence people the world around through Hiles Anderson College and training people to serve Jesus Christ and uh, punch holes in the darkness wherever in the world they go by the training they receive here. Then we have a chance to have a Hammond Baptist Schools that does equally the same thing in the grade school, junior high and high school. In a few weeks, we'll have our City Baptist School, which is our bus children's school that young people uh, who ride our buses go to a Christian school about five blocks from here, and they'll have a graduation here on uh, just a few weeks, the first Sunday night of May. We'll enjoy highlighting them. But what a joy it is to be a part of a church family that does something really 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the cause of Jesus Christ. And I appreciate committed people that do that. This month of April, we're speaking about stewardship, the stewardship of God's people. You know, everything in life really is a stewardship because God owns everything, He controls everything, and He provides everything. No man pulls himself up by his own bootstraps and is self sufficient. We all need God. God has given us every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights with whom there's no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So we're speaking about our responsibility to steward or to manage what God has given us. And of course, we manage our talents. God has given us, if there's any talents that we have, the Lord has given us those talents. Our treasure, our finances, we spoke a little bit about that in recent weeks. Your money is not your money. It's the Lord's money that God has entrusted with you. My money is not mine. The training we received, that is something that God gave us. The trials that we face are uniquely given to you. And mine are uniquely given to me. And I'm a steward of those trials and difficulties. But we're also a steward of our children. The children that God has given us, it's a stewardship. I remember as a 23-year-old, brand-new father in Bellflower, California, Linda had, uh, had gone about a week late in her delivery, and we thought, man, we're going to, this baby, and of course you go a few weeks before, and the doctor said, any time now. Well, that went on for three weeks, any time now. And this is our first one. I thought, man, what is going on? It was late. And I remember the day she said, John, I think we need to go to the hospital. Boy, I was scared to death and nervous. We had gone to Lama's classes. Oh, that was exciting, you know. <laughs> Walking around with the pillow and, and in the, uh, embarrassed beyond measure, you know. And, and uh, I went in there and it came time for the baby. You know, she was starting to have contractions. We were going to go natural with Lama's. And boy, it was exciting. And I remember all the breathing exercises, you know. <laughs> I was telling her, you know, and she goes, oh, it's hurting, it's hurting. Okay, honey, let's breathe. Ready? <laughs> she said, stop blowing in my face, you know. I said, oh. My precious wife, she's never, never got upset with me, but she got upset with me that day, you know. I said, honey, I'm trying. Thank God there was someone else there, an experienced mother had given birth to eight children already before, so she stepped in, and I went out in the hallway and cried, you know. <laughs> when it was all over, we had a beautiful little boy, and Tyler Mark Wilkerson, and certainly we loved him, and I remember sitting beside Linda in that hospital bed and holding him and praying, and praying and saying, Lord, we understand this beautiful boy, and I could not have been more happy as a father. But I understand this baby doesn't belong to us. It belongs to you. And we want to do it the way you want. We want to raise this child the way you want it raised. We understand that it's a gift from you, and we're so grateful that you entrusted us with this gift. And boy, we enjoyed raising him. That, that particular prayer was tested for us 17 years later when we got a phone call at 2.39 in the morning that he, God had chosen to take him to heaven in a very freak accident in which no one was injured but him. And there he went home to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And that time we weren't in a hospital bed. We were standing in the hallway of our house holding each other and remembering that prayer that that child was never ours one day. He was always God's. And, but it was our responsibility to take care. Remember when he went to school, we had an option. What were we going to do with school with him? We enrolled him into a Christian school. And for the last 20 years of our life, we have paid our tuition every month and still do to this day. For our children, we have the joy to enroll them in Hammond Baptist schools, and, and we do a 12-month a year. We pay it every single month, all year long, so we can have our children in the Christian school. I'm very thankful for that privilege. Because those children are not ours, they're the Lord's. Now, you can't home educate your children. We've got to be very careful where we, where we send them, and that's, of course, a conviction with me. I was in third grade. I was, excuse me, I was in second grade, and I was going to a school that things were changing rapidly. My dad realized that. I was coming home and millions and millions and millions of years ago, all the things, of all the things they can tell you, the first thing you hear as a kindergartner in most secular institutions is millions and millions and millions of years ago. We study dinosaurs. I was going to a gathering, a birthday party. My dad said, how about giving that little boy a Bible? And I threw a fit. I said, no, Dad, they'll laugh at me if I give him a Bible. I said, no, Dad, i got to give him something else. I don't want to do that. They, if I give him a Bible, they're going to make fun of me. And my, my dad realized very quickly, hold on a second, something's not right here for my oldest son to be arguing about if a child should have a Bible. Someone's going to make fun of him. And so he began to try to find a Christian setting in which me and my five siblings went to. My parents never owned a home. They paid rent. We lived in government housing projects, old farmhouses. But every month they paid a Christian school tuition for all of my siblings and for me. Sacrifice much. We didn't drive new cars, much less a nice, we didn't drive a nice car, much less a new car. But that was as important to my father and my mother as their children. We never had cable television. A lot of things that just weren't important to them as long as we could get our tithe and our offerings, we can put food, a place over our, our head, and keep that Christian school payment going. That was the passion of my parents. I'm very thankful for that, for that sacrifice. I, my dad's with Jesus now. He's been there for 20 years since I was 27 years old. But I will be forever grateful for every sacrifice my mom and dad made so that I could be in an environment where I could grow and where I could be influenced by Christian people and learn the Word of God and learn the songs of God and, yes, participate in so many things, but more than anything is to be taught of the Word of God. And I'm grateful that I have that testimony today. In Psalms 127, we just read this passage of Scripture. I'll not spend a lot of time here. Just basically uses a springboard. But the Bible says here that children are in heritage of the Lord. And the fruit of the womb is His reward. That means our children belong to God and they're our stewardship. That means they cannot manage themselves at the stage that they are. They have, God has given you that stewardship. Mom, Dad... It is your responsibility to raise your children and nurture and admonition of the Lord. I was watching, and I would like to encourage you to consider watching a little thing on the Internet called Overruled Movie. Overruledmovie.com. You'll see about a 35-minute documentary, and it scares you to death. The United Nations is pushing Globally, and, and, and the American people are embarrassed because we haven't bought into it yet, but basically it is, a, it is a pride to make sure that parents do not have the right and responsibility to decide for their children. And that's ridiculous, friend. The Bible tells us that children are a heritage of the Lord, and God says, Moms and dads, fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. He gives that responsibility to fathers and to mothers to be keepers at home, to love their own children. I thank God I was a teacher in a, in a school for 11 years before I became a pastor in the year 2000. And I realized 
I was an extension of a Christian home. I was an extension of the parents. I'm not the parent. I was an extension of the parent for the seven and a half hours a day that they were in my classroom. Whether I was teaching history, I'm an extension of the parents. Every young person, every person on this, this, uh, uh, this platform that administrates a school, every teacher needs to understand your role is not that of a parent. For those kids, it is that of a teacher, an extension of their mom and dad. That's a biblical thing. God did not give the job. If your children don't do well, it's not the church's fault. It's not going to be the school's fault. If my children don't do well, I'll never be able to blame a school. That is my responsibility. If I ever delegate that to somebody else and blame them, I believe I, 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 I do not have a leg to stand upon. It's my responsibility as a mom, as a mom and as a dad, as a, as a leader of my family to oversee that. I have a stewardship. I don't want to relinquish that. I would say to you, sir... No, never relinquish the spiritual leadership of your home. You are the leader. Your wife may be a better Christian than you. She may be, and my, I'm married to a lady I think is a better Christian than me, but I'm still the I have still the responsibility for my home and for those children that call me dad. And I want to take that responsibility, and to steward that, I've got to be continually sober and vigilant because there's someone else who wants not just the body of our children, they want the mind of our children. Paul, uh, Apostle Peter wrote this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil is a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The lions, I understand, in the jungles and also in those open fields of Africa, they don't always look for the big buck. He's too fast, too smart, too wily. They like to find a weak one, a wounded one, a weary one, and a young one to get hold of. Most every commercial you see on television is aimed at our children. The music videos are not aimed at the 50s or 60s. They're aimed at the young people. The dress, those who are designing the dress and designing the clothes are aimed at the young people. They want the set, they want their hearts I think there's some things we can learn today, and I'm going to share the first part this morning and then again tonight, several areas in which you and I are stewardships of our children. We're stewards. We spend, really, sometimes you spend the first two years trying to teach your children how to walk and to talk. We get excited about that. We spend the next 18 years trying to get them to sit down and close their mouth. We have a stewardship, a responsibility. And number one, I want to share with you, we have the stewardship of their self-assessment before God. Or we would use sometimes, I don't really care for the term too much, self-esteem. I think it's oftentimes changed in, in, in philosophical ways. I don't really like the term self-esteem. It's not a biblical word, nor is self-assessment. But to know that your child needs to know that what they are in the mind of God. The Bible says, your child is the apple of God's eye. So we're poor and needy, yet the Lord thinketh upon us. I think number the one things we have to steward as parents is to help your child understand how precious they are to God. Psalms 139, verse number 14, the Bible says, I am fearful, fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. One of the things that oftentimes hurt young people is intense rejection that they feel in this world we live in. Rejected by a dad who won't stay with the family. Rejected by a mom who is too occupied with other things. Rejection is very difficult and we have a wonderful opportunity oftentimes to help people that are coming out of hurting lifestyles and oftentimes a similar common denominator is there is some hurtful rejection that they're dealing with. Satan is, is very wily. From the very first person he encountered, the first creation he encountered with Eve, he said, yea, hath God said. You believe what God said? Oh, if I eat this fruit. No, you're not going to die. Let's not only question God, but let's tell him that he's a liar. And then that God doesn't just want you to be like him. God does not care about you. You know, some of you right now, you've got beautiful clothes on. You look nice. You've got a Bible under your arm, but you don't like to hear 
the, th the term, God loves you. Or when you hear that, it bothers you. You, write, you say stuff like in your heart, right. He doesn't love me like he loves. If he loved me, then why? All that is saying is that you have fallen into a trap that Satan wants you to know is that God does not care about you. A child needs to know. And he needs someone to watch out for him and help him in his spiritual assessment of himself in God's opinion. God loves him. So glad I think about this. And the, probably the first song I learned as a little boy in Sunday school was, Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. That's so important to know. I thought about that. You know, wonder why people are, people are that way. They, they, they have a hard time, but yet even somehow, even subconsciously, God in his goodness lets little children hear that song their first thing they learn. So needless to know that your children are loved. And moms and dads, it's our responsibility to help steward them to get a right assessment of their life before God. Let me give you a couple thoughts about that, if I can, please. Of course, in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 6, the Bible says we're amazed at the praise of his glory. That means that God has something very special for your child. He needs to know that. A couple ways we can make that happen. Number one is to give them the proper view of God. Show them your opinion of God. Tell them about how you feel about God and how that God loves you and how thankful you are. Oftentimes, praise God in your home and in your place. And when you pray for the dinner, when you see something in the community or you see something good happen to you, don't say, well, it's a good thing I worked hard and that's how I got that raise. we got to go back to say, God is so good to me. Give them a good opinion of God. Everything in this world goes against the God that we should love and serve. I was speaking to a man this week about the gospel of Christ, and I shared the gospel, and thank God he got saved. But we went through the little bit about our sinful nature. And, you know, you don't, you, people in this, in, this, in this world, in this world, they continually damn God's name. Of all the people you can cuss, why do they curse Jesus Christ? Even in predominantly atheistic countries, they curse the name of Jesus. In one Soviet bloc country, a missionary told me, the men have a way they curse Jesus, and the women use another word to curse Jesus. And if you were to ask them, do you believe in God, they would say no, but they curse a God they don't believe in. That's more the proof that he exists. But what is that? Have you ever heard anyone get mad and say, well, Buddha, and damn his name? Or damning the name of Muhammad, or Hare Krishna, and damn his name? No. Or damn the name of Jesus Christ. Our society is bent against him, that he is not good, that he is bad to you. If you give your life to him, you'll regret it. But a child needs to be taught that God loves them. And that is more, that is more, uh, that's more uh, caught than taught. From a dad and a mom who believe the same thing. Listen, mom, if you're not sure God loves you, I can tell your kids are getting the same vibes. Sir, if you're not, if you're not sure God loves you, you're struggling with that, go take God at his word. He said, I've loved you with an everlasting love, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. For God so loved the world. It needs to be shown that God, well, what our opinion of God is. Number two, we need to praise our children. Catch them doing things right. Praise, affection, and affirmation. Every child needs to know that. Every child needs to know that their parents love them. And they give them proper affection. They need to be touched graciously, tenderly, never immorally. They need to know the infection. They need to know the approval and the affirmation of their parents. Many of us parents, if we see our children, we, we tend to go with the negatives rather than the positives. One man said to me not too long ago, and I heard him with a group, and it really impressed me. He said, children need three things. Number one, they need affection. They need, number two, direction. Number three, they need correction. They need affection. He said, in his opinion, probably 70% of child rearing is 
convincing that child that they're loved. It's interesting to me that when the Apostle Paul was praying for people, he said, I pray that you will know the love of Christ. You'll know the breadth, the depth, the height, the length of the love of Christ. He said 20% of child rearing is giving your child direction, helping them know what to do. And then if you give them proper affection and give them direction, then you will have to spend only about 10% giving them correction, telling them what not to do in a bad situation or dealing with them when they do something wrong. <coughs> so number one, we need to steward their self-assessment before God. Help them know that God loves them. Give them praise and affirmation and affection that is natural for a mom and dad to say, well, I don't know, my dad didn't do it that way. Find out what God tells us to do and do it. Remember, remember years, just a few weeks ago, we had someone come in and talked about uh, Brother, Brother Dan Johnson on one of the things that hurts child rearing is when we provoke our children to wrath. We make our children angry and it wounds them and bitters them. And they're not, they're not without excuse. They have to deal with that. What happens to you? Quit, if you're in someone that just always blames your mother and blames your dad, somewhere along the line, you're going to have to grow up, friend. You're going to have to say, you know, what happens to me does not make or break me, but how I respond to it. You say, well, I, the way I was raised, there's always someone who had it worse than you, and God helped them out of that mess. And God helped them. He'll help you too. The second thing I want to quickly give to you is we need to steward their structure and submission. Children need training. They need structure. What kind of, what kind of environment are they, are they growing in? And are they being disciplined? Children who are disciplined and loved, the Bible says if a man doesn't chasten his son, he hates his son. But he that loveth his son, chasten him be times. That means early on in their life. Someone told me one time, John, if you don't break the will of your child by four, they'll break your heart by 14. Somewhere along the line, when they're young, we must teach them basic principles and help them. And in our society, and I'm not being critical of ladies that work, sometimes that is, that is just, there's no, a single mom, there's just no choice. But if at all possible, give your attention to your child in those, they'll learn more from birth to four years old than will learn in any four years of their entire life. Give them the attention of that time. If you have to work, give them the attention. Work at that. Work at giving them the, the edification, the encouragement, the structure, and teach them submission. The Bible says we learn obedience by the things that we suffer. Going through difficulty. Don't despise the chasing of the Lord. And if, it's, if discipline is given lovingly and graciously and carefully and with, with proper reasons, children will, will grow in that environment. The most secure children, they know what their boundaries are. Give your child not only a right assessment of themselves before God, but give them structure and submission. A couple thoughts that come with that. Number one, begin early. If you have children that are under five years old, especially give attention and teach them three things. You know, they, they don't even know how to spell their name, but they can learn three things before they're five. Number one, we do what's right. We'll do the right thing. That's why parents should continually say, is that right? Is that right? Is that right? We want to do what's right. They need to learn what is right to do. Number two, they can learn to obey. They can learn to obey early on in their life that dad and mom are the boss and I'll do what they tell me to do. They can learn obedience and obedience should be immediate obedience. It should be complete obedience and it should be sweet obedience. Let them answer your questions. Let them learn early on. Teach them before. They'll never remember a discipline that you give them and help you give them before, before uh, after, or anything that's done before five years old. They don't remember that. But they can learn to do the right thing, to obey their parents, and they can learn to respect their authorities. They can learn a little fit. You know, when a little child throws a fit, it might be funny, but it's not funny when they're 33 still showing us throwing a fit. It's never funny. It's never funny. You can see the Adamic nature come out in them, but boy, deal with those things, and that's not respectful. No, no, you're going to do that. We're going to do the right thing. When they're little, they can learn that. Number two, I would suggest, is focus on just a few ground rules. Don't give them 75 rules when they're three years old. They can't handle it. 
Give them simple things. We do what's right. You do not obey. We will res be respectful. Help them with that. And train them and reinforce those things. Very important. And then I would say also, seek loving consistency. Probably our challenge as parents the most, and you pray for me, I'm not done. We still have a five-year-old in our home. And it's, it, we're not done. We have, I'm not here coming to you as a professional, someone who is the guru of child rearing. No siree. I'm probably the roo-roo of child, child rearing. <laughs> I've got a lot of work to do here. But one of our challenges for Linda and I is to be consistent. Just to be consistent in our, in our thing. Because sometimes we are moody as parents. And moody parents hurt their children. One time we blow up, blow a gasket. Next time, oh, it's okay, son. They're like, I'm so confused. Not being consistent. Ask God. And by the way, the, the key to consistency, in my opinion, is a spirit-filled life. Jesus is the same yesterday, <coughs> today, and forever. You attach your little wagon to Jesus, and you'll be pretty stable. You attach it to your same emotions and your soul, and you're going to be up and down like a yo-yo, just like I've been much of my life, when I'm not Holy Spirit filled. Next thing I would encourage you, number one, help steward your child's self-esteem or assessment before God. Steward his structure and teach him submission. Number three, steward their surroundings. Their surroundings and their influences. The Bible tells us in numbers of ways, but let me just give you their first, their first surrounding is your home. Does your home speak of Jesus? If we walked into your home, would we know you're a Christian just by your decorations, the ambiance of your home? Can we tell that you're a child of God? What's the first thing that goes on in your home? Do you just turn the television on and leave it on for all the commercials, all the things, whatever's next on there that, that they want to put into the child's mind or heart or your heart and mind? What goes on in the ears of those in your home? Is your home a Christian? Everybody needs a Christian home. Everybody needs a heavenly home. Everybody needs a church home. But children need a Christian home that's obviously Christian. The first surrounding I need to address is, what about my house? Is it a place of solace? Is it clean? Is it orderly? Is it cared for? Is it, it doesn't have to be fancy, but is it, is it somewhat structured? Do kids can't wait to get out of the home because it's so, it's so monotonous or so difficult or so crazy? Or is it a place they enjoy being at? Because it, where Jesus is, there's peace. The Bible says the kingdom of God is not meat and drink or how much you eat, how much you drink, what you do, all that stuff. It's more righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Having that thing will be of a help to us. Let's look at the next thing, if I can. Tell you, your next area is your school. And we're here at Hammond Baptist Schools here. That's who we're talking about for a few minutes here. I thank God for a Christian education because it, the Bible says to learn not the way of the heathen. He tells us in Psalms 1, 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the seat of the scorn, or sits in the, excuse me, or stands in the way of sinners, or sits in the seat of the scornful. You know, children don't really choose where they go to school. That's mom and dad's stewardship. You want to find a place that is, it mirrors your heart for your child, if at all possible. And very, very important, because you've got to think about a Christian school, the people are important. The program is important, and the product is important. The philosophy is important. You want to evaluate that because if you're not careful. You and I, we're doing one thing over here in our home and something else going totally different over here. And they're, they're counterproductive to each other. A school environment, that's something that we as leaders of our school and these men who sit here must continually watch guard over what kind of an environment do we have going on in our Christian education. I think another place is, is our friends, the children and their friends. Let me tell you something, friend. You know this already. But a friend can mess up in a few moments what parents have been working for for a lifetime. Amnon had a friend. My father was a big man, 350 pounds. My sister's here today. Mary, raise your hand real quickly, Mary. This is my precious sister. I'm the oldest of six, and she's the youngest of six. Our father was a very big man, and he had terrible skin cancer, for his face was terribly marred, and his lips were moved, and his, tongue, his nose was, was kind of cut off. And 
And, and he was raised in an alcoholic's home, and so there was a lot of challenges there. But our dad loved us dearly. He loved us dearly. But one of the things my dad thought was his business is who my friends were. And if there was anything that I went toe-to-toe -to -toe with my dad often on, it was over friends. Because as you go into adolescence there, you start, you start, friends become really important to you, and your parents take or leave them, as long as they give me something to eat. Still go back there and get my stuff I need. But friends become very important to us. But I remember my dad, my friends are very important to him too. Because he had read a Bible verse like this, he that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. He read another verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where it says, be not deceived, don't kid yourself. Evil communications corrupt good manners. He spent a lifetime trying to get us children to have good manners, to behave ourselves wisely, to do the right thing, to obey, to be respectful. And he could tell when a friend had come in counterproductive to that. And whenever that happened, he would cloud up and rain all over me. He would get all over me. He would, he would get to me. He would approach me. He would confront me. I do not like that young man. You be nice to him, but you stay as far away from him as possible. He's not a bad kid. I'm not saying he's bad. I'm just, he, when you and him get together, it's not good. And he would watch that like a hawk, and I couldn't stand that. That bothered me to no end. But now, years later, I see that young man and the young men he was talking about, and I see where they are in life. Not that I'm anything special, but... I see them paying alimony, child support, jail, issues. By God's grace, God's, God's taking me a different road by his grace. I think, boy, my dad was smarter than I thought, I, I thought he was. He loved me enough to confront me and to protect my surroundings at home, at school, and with my friends. And lastly, on this particular thought, is in the media. Media is tremendously moving our young people today. Most of it, most of us guys that are older, we have no clue what's going on. I can't even figure out how to turn on a computer, much less know what happens in a computer. I have a problem with an iPhone, I hand it to my five-year-old, she can fix it. <laughs> it's amazing how in, in, they just know how to, their kids now live in this, this thing. There is a reason why, why the devil is called the prince and power of the air. The airwaves of the television, the satellites, the cell towers, all of that stuff is airwaves, and Satan uses that to his advantage. I don't think it's all bad. I don't think you throw the baby out with the basketball. They're wonderful tools, but they have to be monitored. Psalms 101 says, I will set no wicked thing before my eye. I hate the works of him that turn aside. They'll not cleave to me. Joshua says, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that, wasn't a, that wasn't I will serve the Lord. He said, hey, everybody in my home, we're doing the right thing here. We're going to do the right thing here. May God help us do that. Protect the surroundings of your children in your home, in your schools, in your, in, with their friends, and especially in media. It's a place that's permeating our, our young people, being very counterproductive. We're not careful with the Internet. We're not careful with television. We're not careful. We just let whatever comes on, comes on. We need to protect our surroundings. We're stewards of that. Don't let that happen on your watch, man. Ma'am, don't let that happen on your watch. You protect that. You and I, and my heart's convicted as I studied about this, to speak to Linda about a couple things. I want to be very careful. Our children, sometimes will collect their little iPads or their phones and just go through them and look at them. We're not going to argue about that. We're going to look at that. That's, that's our business. It's our watch. It's our time. And they're not going to tell us what to do. We're going to help them know what to do. Well, I don't want to confront them. I don't want to get them mad. Who cares if they're mad? You protect them. Someone's house on fire, you'll say, well, I don't want to, they're, they're mad me get mad at me. No, get them out of the fire. Help them. Last thing real quickly, we are the stewards of their salvation opportunities. Young people need to get saved. The only thing you'll take out of your home to heaven is your children that God's given you. The truth of the matter is, though, you can't save them. 
I remember Linda and I, we have prayed oftentimes that God would save our children. We believe most of them are saved. There's maybe some we don't, we're waiting for God to deal in their hearts, bring conviction of sin. But you know what we want to do? I want to keep them in every opportunity so they can hear the gospel. The most powerful thing in the world is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. We got folks that they, they don't come to Sunday night. I'm glad my parents took me to church on a Sunday night because it was a Sunday night. I heard the gospel all my life on Sunday mornings, but it was a Sunday night God chose to bring conviction to my heart. And I didn't drive myself to church. My parents drove numbers of miles to get me to that location on a Sunday night. They inconvenienced themselves. They spent money they didn't have to put fuel in a car. They, they probably couldn't afford to do, but that was a priority. It wasn't even questioned. They got me in a Christian school where I heard the gospel oftentimes. I heard the truth. Oh, I didn't have all the perfect teachers. They weren't always the best examples. They're human beings. I understand that. But boy, I'm telling you, I'm so glad for Miss Hutchinson who taught me the Bible. I'm so glad for my elementary school teachers, my junior high teachers, my high school. I'm so glad for my coaches that were Christians and we would pray at practices and we would, he would teach us principles. I sat in, the, in a basketball uh, uh, locker room this year and listened to Brother Woosley as they won a game or even they lost a game and he said, let me tell you something, this, this will help you in life. Thank God I had the same thing growing up. Wonderful testimonies. But I'm glad that someone stewarded my salvation opportunities. In Isaiah 54, 13, our close is here. He says, your children need to be taught to the Lord, and great will be the peace of your children. I want to have peaceful children. I want them to have peace. And peace does not come because of a parent. It comes because the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ but I can do my best to expose them to the gospel. But you can't give your children salvation or opportunities unless you're saved. Mom and dad, maybe you're here and you're not sure if you were to die, you'd go to heaven. Please, don't leave like that. Maybe you're a young person and you're not saved. Salvation is the most important decision in this world, and there's nothing in the world worth going to hell over. Usually people go to hell over two reasons, pride and procrastination. They're too proud to admit they don't know how to get to heaven and or they procrastinate another time, another situation, not now. Don't put that off. Let's, let's stand together, can we please?